The New Level Cap Podcast is a show about fun, friends, game design, and all things otherwise. Your hosts are Marco DeSantos and Brad Talton of Level 99 Games. I'm Chris Solis, your producer, and without further ado, please enjoy the show. Whenever I see girls and boys selling lanterns on the streets, I remember it's Christmas and it's Christmas podcast time. No, <laughs> it's not even Halloween yet. Welcome to the Level Christmas Podcast. No, featuring me, Marco DeSantos, also known as your Christmas boy. I'm and with me is a, Well, with me is a very special guest, the one, the only anti Christmas. I am anti Christmas. Halloween all the way. Uh, this is Jackie Florian, also known as Kanashimi. I work in the licensing and branding department, and I say department as if it's a bunch of people, but it's really just me. <laughs> you are the whole department. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know that scene from Star Wars where the Emperor says, I am the Senate? That's like you. Like, I am the department. Yeah, um, but it's also like you with it is Christmas and it is not. It is not even it Halloween. It is Christmas. How no! dare you? It is Christmas. I'm I I love decorating for Halloween. I love decorating for Christmas. Ironically, I'm not going to be in the United States for for Halloween, so I can't decorate this year, but how dare you skip over Halloween? You get good Okay, number 1. You get to dress number up. Number 1. I'm not skipping over Halloween. I'm okay. just saying that it's Christmas, then Halloween for a day, and then Christmas again. What? No. Um, Hello? No, that's too expensive. Yes. <laughs> and here's the big deal, right? In my country, uh, in the mystical land of the Philippines slash Wyoming, um, <laughs> that's a joke now, apparently, because people say that the Philippines isn't real and Wyoming isn't real, and therefore Wyoming and the Philippines are the same place. So um, in the mystical land of the Philippines and Wyoming, uh, Christmas actually starts in September. Really? So <laughs> I'm not even kidding. So... So Christmas starts September one and ends January thirty or something like that. Like we have five months of Christmas. Oh I am my not gosh! Because I like the I'm aware I'm aware of are, like other places where they have Thanksgiving at a different time than us, like Canada. And then you can equate um like Oban to sort of like a Japanese Thanksgiving. It's not obviously not the same background, but you can equate those. Yeah, it's kind of like it's like it's like that kind of holiday. Yeah, that right? kind of holiday. Yeah. So I understand that like different cultures have that, but like five months of Christmas, like how do you not get sick of Jingle Bells? <laughs> like oh no, it's you, you cannot even imagine. I I literally went into the mall two days ago, and they were literally playing. All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. And oh, we've gotten to song. this point where, like, it's just Christmas songs everywhere. It's not even October yet. Like, Halloween just doesn't exist in our country. It's just all Christmas, all the time. You're listening to Mariah Carey, Jose Marie Chan. It's just, that's just how it works. That's just how the world works at this point. Um, another song that's really popular is the song that I was singing in the intro. But hey, whatever. I can't. I can't deal. I'm sorry. I'm vetoing it. <laughs> well, you can't veto something that you're not part of, Jackie. I'll, I'll make a licensed agreement to to and to veto to invalidate uh, to invalidate the festivities. You're you're gonna invalidate the entirety of Christmas uh, for for five months uh, time period. We'll only sign an agreement for about two months. Um, which will make it fair and actually work better with our release schedule. <laughs> that sounds very licensy of you. And actually, uh, is why you're on the show for this episode. Uh, we oh, put out goody. a call to everyone in the Discord uh, asking them, Hey, what are some questions you have for Marco and Jackie? Uh, because we're going to do a special Q&A episode today. Uh, a special Christmas Q&A episode. Um, so, we're here. We're Yay. beer. And we're deer. Golden deer. And Fire there's nothing three to houses. fear. Claude is yeah. the best character in that game, just FYI. Claude, Claude <laughs> is indeed the best character. He's, um, he's did you, like did you fundamentally know? the only good character in the entire game. Like, good-hearted in every every route. I'm just saying. Well, yeah, that's fair. I mean, if you think about it, um, did you know that Claude's moniker in the Japanese version of the game is actually different than his English moniker of the Master Tactician? Oh. Apparently. So apparently in the Japanese version, his name translate his moniker translates to the tabletop monster or something like that. Wait, really? So, yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, he's accurate for this podcast, I guess, because we are all about tabletop board games and all that stuff. 
Perfect, actually. Yeah. It must have been instincts. That's why I went the golden deer route. <laughs> yeah, go- golden deer is mm, mwah, best. I also picked golden deer just because I like the color yellow. So I actually um, wanted to go with uh, Edelgard, but I didn't like any of the men in, the, in her house. So I ended up going with Golden Deer because I think Claude was like number one choice. And I recruited everyone in my first playthrough except Casper and Ferdinand. They were sitting at a B support forever, and I just could never unlock those B supports. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm never recruiting them. Great. I guess they're forever. They're going to die. I guess, I guess I'm going to kill them five years from now. I mean, um, I, you know, it's interesting because, like, uh, the battle that Casper showed up in, I did not have to kill him. I had to kill somebody else, and then the battle ended. So Casper is alive somewhere. Congratulations. Doing, doing something. <laughs> Casper is a good boy. How dare you? Um, Voiced by the wonderful yeah. Ben Diskin, I believe. Okay. Well, you know what? Fire Emblem, three houses, talk aside. Maybe we'll do an entire podcast for that on our fan cast. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> The fire emblem. Oh, by the way, Jackie, hmm. let me let me annoy you and literally all the other people oh, listening no. to this podcast right now. The Christmas um, so wasn't the, enough for you? You had to make no, no, it there, more painful? There are insignias in Fire Emblem Three Houses, right? Yes. And then your character has an insignia. What what is it? What is it? What is it? Is it like the fire? Like, it's like the, the crest, flame something? It's the crest of flames, a.k.a. the fire okay, emblem. So, Aka the fire. Emblem. Yeah, like I, I don't. I, maybe that came across like more witty in Japanese, but in English, I rolled my eyes into the back of my head when I heard it. Look, I was like, "It's literally a fire emblem, guy." Yeah, like it was, it was. Yeah, it was. It was the cheese was real. <laughs> you know what? Cheese can be real, but questions are also real. Are you ready for this? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So again, we put out a call to all of our people out there. Uh, remember, you can always send questions in to the uh, link in the description if you ever want to get your question answered. Remember, it's not a guarantee that it will be answered, but it's a guarantee that it might be answered. First question comes from Reggie. Why is Marco my favorite level 99 staff member? I don't, I don't know, Marco. Why is he your favorite, favorite level 99 staff member? Ah, <laughs> oh, gee. I, I don't know. Marco's a really cool guy, <laughs> you know. He has a, he has an electric person. No, I'm kidding. Uh, maybe it's just because it's my job to get people to like me. I mean, I'm the most front facing person in the entire company, right? Like, yeah, like no, totally. outside of Brad, I'm probably the most recognizable face. If that was <laughs> so, a if that was a question for me, I do very much enjoy working with Marco. Um, we generally jive on a lot of um out facing projects. Um, because we're thinking about uh, content creation and how to kind of set the the bar for our quality and set it higher. So I find that we work together really well. Also, he owns Tigers, which is really dope. Yeah. Uh, for people who don't know, I am uh, secretly a prince and uh, own Tigers. Um, so I got meme here. Tiger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you, you got to make a Sagat joke uh, every now and then. Okay, next question. What is the most challenging aspect of working for a board game slash tabletop game uh, for the board game slash tabletop game industry? And what's the most enjoyable aspect of it? All right. Well, this is uh, this is an interesting question as somebody who I've often said, like, I'm the new blit when it comes to board games. Um, it's not really like a hobby that I was super passionate about and I pursued. Um I'm really into like video games and anime, however, and I have a, you know, a deep background with that and worked in a previous job that had those aspects. Um, however, in terms of what is the most challenging thing about board games, I think it's um, something you'd actually find in a lot of other industries uh, is that you have a lot of very creative people and creativity does not necessarily equal like a standard of business. And this is not saying anything bad about anyone I work with or anything. It's just some people are wired differently. So I'm very business. I'm very straightforward. Sometimes people will even call me aggressive. Um, And I find that sometimes business and creatives just don't work together. There's a clash because a the business is not thinking about the creativity freedom of a project or like how cool it would be if we're doing this. They're thinking about, well, how much does this cost? 
how much development time is this? And so, What's our deadline? Yes. you got to meet the expectations of the stakeholders yes. and stuff like that. So I would say that the most challenging aspect is basically speaking the same language. Um, that's definitely something that for me can sometimes be extremely difficult, particularly because I'm not as versed in board game tabletop games. So like I had to learn so many like new terms, like, you know, like Euro game or railway game. Like, yeah, I can think that it makes a railway game, but there's a whole genre of railway games. That's a thing, (laughs) you you know, like (laughs) it's it's an entire genre for some reason, but yes. Yeah. Or like board state, right. I wouldn't think, oh, this is the board state. I would think this is a board. And like one of the words that, um, I have not used in my normal vocabulary because nobody in around me would know what I'm talking about is a meeple. Like it, like what is a meeple? I would never know what a how meeple could, is without working this job. How could people not know what a meeple is? It's iconic. It, it is like the face of board games, right? It's, well, if you, if so, let's say I, I, I use normie a lot, but let's say you're you're a random Joe. You don't play board games. Maybe you play like yeah, Monopoly fair. and Jenga. And like, if you play Monopoly, you're like, oh, I want to be the token or the little doggy, right? Like, you don't think that you don't think of this meeple or this wooden guy even has a name. It's just the little person. It's the little dude. Yeah, right? that's that's completely okay. You know what? That's completely fair. Yeah, and it's something that like there's 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 communication issues sometimes because there's so much that I have to still, um, you know, take in that I just don't know yet. So um, that's completely fair. I'd that's say that that's completely fair. the most challenging thing thus far. In terms of the most enjoyable, uh, it's just everybody's really passionate. Um, I have a lot of freedom in my job and there's that creativity. So just like it can be a challenging thing because of language barriers, it can also be the best thing because you can see people's passion. um, You can see all of the work they put into something and their love of what they're doing and how people will enjoy their game. And some of the cool things that I can, you know, work with with my deals and offer to that game to make it reach more people. And that's something that is just, great for everybody involved. So the the challenging aspect is the people and the most enjoyable aspect is the people, which is probably a very boring answer, but there's your answer. I mean, it's a it's a real answer, you know? That's what life is. Uh life is about the yins and the yangs and all that stuff. Uh, by the way, did I mention who asked that question? That was Bergs, in case I didn't mention it. That question came from Bergs. Thank uh, you. Bergs. My answer is going to be really short and simple. Um the hardest part is probably the culture which I guess is similar to your answer. Uh, mm-hmm. The thing about it is that tabletop culture in my country is very different uh, because there's no such thing as tabletop culture in my country. The tabletop culture is we all play Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering and no other games. Like, like that's it. Oh, sometimes Warhammer 40k. Uh, but, but that's really weird because when you try to ask people about other games, it's very hard to you know get convince them to play anything other than Magic slash Warhammer slash D&D. And that's kind of like where the impasse I'm at is. So um, it's kind of weird in that sense. The best part of this is probably the community. Tabletop people uh, can be very passionate. uh, And sometimes that's a bad thing. But most of the times that's a great thing. And, you know, sometimes we get fans making really, really intense stuff. So for BattleCon, for example, somebody made like an entire robust AI that can play BattleCon so good that it beats me around 70% of the time. I'm not saying I'm the best BattleCon <laughs> player in the world, but I'm definitely not the worst. So, like, if it can consistently beat me, like, 70% of the time, that's a really good AI. Like, oh, spicy. Um, that's and dope. then, yeah, and then for Millennium Blades and Argent, people have made, like, random setup generators. People have done fan art. People have done fan fiction. It's really, really fun to see all of the crazy stuff people have made for our games. Uh, and I really like highlighting them and calling them out whenever I can. So uh, shout outs to the people who make fan art and fan stuff for our games. Yeah, please Are share that with for- us. Tag tag us on Twitter or Facebook or even come into our Discord and show us that stuff. Yeah, we usually uh, lose our minds over how cool most of it is. Next question comes from RBY or Ruby or Ruby. Um, Ruby's going to be really mad that I mispronounced their name. <laughs> What is the actual process for licensing an IP? Are some companies more difficult than others? Any big horror or success stories you want to share? Omitting names, of course. And of course, why did you decide to get this job? 
Oh, that's a that's a layered question. So in terms of the actual process for licensing an IP, I would depend on what country of origin you're talking to. So if you're talking to a Western company, I would argue that a majority of the time it's going to be a little less involved. Not necessarily easier, just less involved. And if you're working, let's say, with an Asian company, um, you're going to have to kind of change your thinking a little bit on exactly what strategy you're going with when you decide to approach them. So you'll want to essentially sense. take more care um, or consideration. So you'll want to offer things that you might not necessarily offer in other situations. So since you're talking about um, big horror success stories, you can tell, um, I will say one while omitting the names just because uh, we, we haven't really talked about it yet. <laughs> and I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Um, However, when we did uh, the biggest anime convention in the United States, I went to Brad and I asked him, can we have a Japanese translator there? I know a guy who will do it. Um, you know, we just need to have somebody there. And he agreed. And the only reason I was able to sign some of the deals that I have is because I had a Japanese translator, which I, I didn't have to do, right? I, it was a consideration that I was presenting to the company to be like, look at how prepared I am. Look at how serious I am. So there was one company that I did approach and I was talking to the Western subsidiary and they were like, oh yeah, you're going to have to talk with the guys on the Japanese side about that. Um, but I don't know if they have any translators, you know, with them or anything. And I said, I have one right here. And he went, I oh, got one. Oh, really? And he turned around and suddenly started looking for them. Because if I didn't have one, he probably would have been like, you know, I'll take your card and it was nice talking to you. Bye. So when it comes to just the strategies and the methods that you're using, it depends on region, depends on property, so on and so forth. Um, with the with that deal, however, um, which I'm I can't say who it is. Uh, we did sign that deal eventually, so yeah, we it's Nintendo, obviously. <laughs> uh, but we wouldn't have we wouldn't have even gotten in the door if we hadn't have prepared that extra consideration to show them how serious we were about the project. Um, That's completely true. As an Asian person myself, I can totally agree that uh, there are certain cultural and politeness gymnastics you have to jump through. And if you don't meet them, um, most of the time, people of my country would at least be offended enough that they will not want to deal with you. So I, yeah. I kind of I kind of understand where you're coming from. Uh, the big question here is uh, what made you decide to get this job? Um, is is it is it wrong to just say I need money? Is that a real <laughs> response? I, I mean, it is a real response. Um, however, it's interesting because my goal was not to get a job in in tabletop, and you know, I never I never expected in a million years I would be working in board games. And that's not to say I have any any dislike for them or anything like that. But you know, I came from a decade of working in radio, so to do that and then to go to do this. It just so happened that my skill set fit the puzzle piece that Brad was looking for. And luckily, I knew Brad uh, through conventions and my work in radio. So it, it just kind of fell into my lap. <laughs> and I'm very happy it did. Um, it's been very enjoyable. It's interesting to me learning about a new industry. I, I just get a lot of enjoyment absorbing as much as I can. And the industry that I was in, you know, um, radio with Asian music and things like that, I had I had dedicated like a decade to it and I was at a point where I wasn't learning anything new or taking anything new in so it wasn't as fulfilling for me as it once was. So this is this is a whole new ball game so I'm constantly learning things. Yeah, well, welcome to the world of tabletop. I think that's <laughs> a that's a very true statement, right? Like, you know, and then part of the job is also learning on the job and learning is what makes fun for most people. Um you know, Brad always talks about in game design that the fun of the game is the space between learning and mastery. Because the moment you master something, uh, it becomes boring and you don't want to play it mm -hmm. again anymore because there's nothing else to learn. So That's um, definitely that's something I'm, I'm really scared about, to be honest, because I can view the company in a lens that's from, you know, like, you know, normal, normal Jane Doe. Right. And I'm I am still worried about like learning so much about you know board games that when i try and do explain it to somebody who doesn't have a an affiliation to board games 
they might not understand some terms that I'm using, or they might not understand, you know, the the sales point and things like that. So right now I can view it kind of with two lenses. And I appreciate that a lot. And I get worried of, of kind of losing that one part of myself. <laughs> well, you're not, you're never going to lose it, I think. Um, but I do think that it is something that people like me and Brad and, you know, people who have been in the company for a bit longer, uh, tend to lose uh, mm-hmm. and tend to lose sight of, right? We don't lose it, right? We just forget to consider it because yeah. we can always consider it. Uh, th- the big thing about it is that, like, like it's really, really hard, like, especially when you're designing games and stuff like that, and you're like, eh, people don't understand this, and then people come back to you and go, like, eh, we don't understand it, and then you're <laughs> like, oh... <laughs> You know, it's it's kind it's kind of stuff like that, which is why like when I design stuff, um, not to say that I've designed any level ninety nine games game, but when I design stuff, it's always a consideration of how simple can we make this garbage, right? Like like I need it to be so simple a monkey can play it. Yeah, uh, and and people tend to like complexity. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with complexity. It's just that complexity presents a barrier by default to a lot of people right it does and um if you want me to be honest the other night i had three people over and i opened argent for the first time i had played it Uh-oh. with you on table argent Simulator. is not a simple <laughs> game to teach to new people it, it, it is not and not only that i can't i can't say that i remembered every aspect of it and i th- and and um, among a few other things, but I wanted to just open it and like set it up and to have people with me while I did it who weren't particularly into board games, just so I could get their comments and their feedback. And like there was, I, I think there was something in the book when you open it, it gives you like tips for strategies. And uh, the first thing one of my friends said is, "I, I don't want tips for strategies. I want to know how to play the game." <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so it's- it was interesting though to to take these properties um, and and look at at some of our IPs with eyes that weren't trained for certain board game mechanics. Um, I'm always yeah, it's always true. finding that very interesting. But mm-hmm. before we move on to more questions, let's take a short break and listen to an ad from Jackie. Because <laughs> whatever, that's going to be weird. Hi, me. Bye, me. <laughs> Noir Automata is on sale for only $5 this week. Use your deductive skills to narrow down suspects and beat your opponent in this Penny Arcade collaboration. Just go on over to level99games.com slash noirdeal to get your steal today. This is the podcast, this is the podcast, Level 99, 99 podcast, dun-dun-dun, dun-dun-dun. It's Halloween! (laughs) No, but... Okay, number one, that entire show is literally about how instead of Halloween, Jack wants Christmas instead. So you're wrong, okay. right? You're you're, you're like, hurting me. Like there was a Halloween aspect to that. Okay, like yeah, yeah, but like that's a like question: re- Is that movie a Halloween movie or a Christmas movie? It's both. It's both. It's both. It's literally both. Like that's the point, right? I don't think I could ever watch that movie during Christmas, though. I think that's a strictly Halloween movie for me. What is a Christmas movie? People watch Die Hard as a Christmas movie. So, well, that makes like... sense, though. There's no Halloween in that movie. <laughs> yeah, but there's Halloween. Oh, whatever, man. <laughs> whatever. Okay, let's move on to some questions, because otherwise I'm going to go Jack Skellington all up in this place. I don't even know <laughs> what that implies. I mean, probably it just means I'm going to start pining for a holiday I'm not meant for, but... Um, like Easter. Blue asks... <laughs> Uh, Easter? Okay, you know what? The only Easter I accept is the one where Hugh Jackman is the Easter bunny. Um, I love that movie, by the way. (laughs) uh, Guardians is great. (laughs) Okay, Uh, Blue asks, Kana, I'm sure it's very exciting to be dealing with a lot of prospective new licenses for level 99. How do you deal with having to keep such deals hidden until they're hashed out enough to reveal them? P.S. Marco, what's your left foot's name? I explicitly told people not to ask me for my left foot's name. It's Gerald. Okay. Um, All right. Learn something about Marco. I didn't need to know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't need to know that, but not all of you know, because this is, the, this is, this is the, what you've wrought upon <laughs> yourself. Um, Jackie, how do we keep things so under wraps? Like, like what's the process of like, what, so for example, we've signed a license with an uh, undisclosed person company from anime convention. Um, 
and I assume we have something in the works right now for the game for that license, mm-hmm. and we're very excited about it. But how do we stop ourselves from blabbing about it so much? Well, actually, before we sign a licensed agreement, um, just to enter into deeper or more descriptive dis- um, discussions or negotiations, we've already signed an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement. And that basically means that the internal aspects of the deal we can't talk about outside of generally the company. Um, I'm TLDR in it quite a bit because there's... Of course, of course. Uh, there, it's a legal document. You got to TLDR it or else exactly. we'll be here until we're old, <laughs> until it's Christmas. So wait, yeah, until yeah. it's Halloween, I mean. <laughs> yes. So um, in terms of dealing with it, um, we've actually, at least since I've been on, have spoken a lot more about keeping... Uh, certain aspects of licensed IP is more under wraps and keeping it protected uh, just so we make sure that we're following a very kind of strict marketing and reveal schedule um, so if all of the places are moving as they should and nothing is late um, which I love timelines I will take a timeline any day in terms of uh, how hard is it it's it's extremely frustrating for me uh, specifically if you guys are making a custom character for a deal I have signed uh, whenever I see that, I just go, man, <laughs> I, so, I Jackie, wish I could say something. Jackie is basically saying, stop making custom characters. <laughs> is that right? No, no. It's just I, I feel bad because then we'll, you know, if we reveal one that you're making a custom character for, and then I don't want you to feel like, oh, I made this custom character for nothing. Like, I would feel really bad. <laughs> That's true. Um, It's happened-ish a few times already, right? I'm pretty sure... That I've made Battlecon characters custom, and then suddenly a Battlecon character comes out, and it looks very similar to my custom, and I'm like, mm, did I just do this for nothing? Uh, but I understand. It's also, but there's this flip side to it, right? Because it's now a chance for you to compare how you did compared to the official release, right? Like, so say I make a character, I make Sans Undertale for Exceed, right? And then, um, and then we suddenly reveal, ha! The new season of Exceed is Sans Undertale. It's it's just Sans. That's it's the only Sans. character in all three boxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just multiple Sanses, right? Um, really upset we thing- didn't get the Papyrus box, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fine. You know, Papyrus is is Papyrus is great, but let's just say we make Sans Undertale, right? And then I made Sans Undertale and released Sans Undertale. I think it's an opportunity for me to see how good my design chops are, right? Because how close is my design to the final design they did for Sans, right? Mm-hmm. And that's like a cool thing, right? And ultimately, the reason most people make custom characters anyway is because they want the character in the game. So if we just officially release the character, I mean, most people are just going to be like, oh, heck yeah, I don't need this custom anymore. You know what I mean? Like, Those are my places of weakness, though, is all I'm saying. <laughs> when you guys uh, that's do fair. that. <laughs> that's fair. My place of weakness is that... Um, it's really hard when people start badgering you about like, hey, get a uh, license X, and then you can't just tell them we already have it. Stop bugging me about it. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm, it's like, I'm, I'm totally good with that. Um, honestly, oh, the, the more that people are talking about it and requesting things, the more that people understand that we have the ability to do those things, and they have the faith in us that we can. So, you know, like if somebody comes by and they go, oh man, I really want... I'm trying to think of a difficult property to get. If it's something like, I really want uh, Transformers or something, um, that would be something that is like harder in difficulty, right? But the fact that you're asking me at least kind of gives me a little hint that, hey, you believe I can do this. You so believe that we can get Transformers. I will try. <laughs> so, Jackie, it's time for Naruto Exceed. Um that Boruto's would actually dad be, exceed. be pretty easy. <laughs> Fundamentally, that would be very easy. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I probably can't talk about things that we talked about at the licensing expo, and this is not a confirmation for anything. Just to clarify, we haven't signed any uh, deals with Viz Media. I can say that because... Or Naruto himself. Yeah, uh, um, just the saying, Hokage. <laughs> just saying, we haven't signed any deals with Viz Media at this time. Um, they're, a, they're a partner that we're familiar with. Um, we have had meetings with them. They're very nice to work with. Um, and that Naruto is a property that they're always trying to get in front of other people. So you never know. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, the one that I've had most often is get Boku no Hero Academia. And I I can't say, can we say that we don't have Boku no Hero Academia, that we can have Boku no Hero? Like, like what, what's, the, what's the status on that? Like, can I say that we don't have it? 
So for My Hero Academia, we are looking into anime properties. Um, the big thing that I have to say with My Hero Academia is right now, um, one of our partners currently is uh, releasing cards for that license, and we don't want to step on each other's foots. Um, we also just, you know, um, we we work with them with a lot of uh, properties, so obviously I don't want to say anything bad. But uh, I also think that it's very valuable for level ninety nine games to get properties on their own for a little bit, um, so just so we can we can have a little bit more control of our releases in terms of around the world, um, not just in North America. That's something that's really important to me uh, moving forward. Is so if you're in Germany or Poland or China, you can get our games in your language. Um, and that's something that I'm pushing really hard moving forward. So to be able to do that, we need to be able to comb through the agreements and make the agreements ourselves. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, so that's yeah, what that, I'll, that, that, that's that what sense. I'll say on that because I don't want to, I don't want to say anything yeah. too, too, yeah. uh, electric, if you will. Yeah. Too, yeah. It's okay. I mean, like my stance is that, uh, I, I really loved, loved Boku no Hero Academia, but not anymore. Well, that's for another episode of the podcast. <laughs> Next question is from Anonymous. Oh, no. Give us more hints about the new Exceed season. Literally anything. <laughs> so, I, in terms of hints, I've actually been giving hints, and this is not to advertise my, my Twitter uh Twitter, but if <laughs> I actually kind of give hints on my Twitter, um, I talk about things that I might be talking about deals with not publicly like I am I am I am talking with X about this property I am a little bit no, nuanced no. than that um, particularly if there are pictures or anything, um, there might be hints there. I will not confirm or deny anything. It is my personal Twitter. It is not connected to level 99, uh, games, mm. just to clarify. So that has plenty of hints if you can find it. And if you but find But there's also out, like 20 red herrings, right? <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Um, I mean, if you can find the pattern, <laughs> look for the Here, pattern. <laughs> here's my, here's my hint. Crowley, you're done. Okay. Um, let's see. What's a hint that I can think of? No, 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 no. Let's end it with Crowley, right? Let, right. let people figure that out. I don't All get right. that hint, and I know what's signed, so we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll explain it to you later. Okay. It, it, it requires a bunch of mental gymnastics, but Crowley. All right. Some French guy asks, does Level 99 have any contact with publishers regarding localizations? Hey, we were just hey. mentioning this earlier. I'm thinking about French localization specifically because I'm sure others would be interested by other languages. As a side note, provided that everyone under 45 years old in France has been exposed to anime as a child, I think that anime aesthetics could work very well in France. I agree. Um, so I'll, I'll do the first point before we get to the anime uh, thing since we just talked about uh, localization. So we are working with some of our um, you know, uh, localization and distributors in other territories territories for Shovel Knight Exceed. I cannot confirm what territories have it yet because we're still in talks. I'm hoping to have news for you um, at the beginning of October, somewhere in that month. We're also going to Essen. So if you are a board game company in another territory and you would like to schedule a meeting with us at Essen, which is in Germany at the end of October, our game market, which is in Japan at the end of November, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are doing what we can to get some of our projects um, out and about. It is very important for me because one of the one of the saddest things I hear from you guys is you can't get the game. Um, and that's, that's really heartbreaking <laughs> for me. So I want to make sure that this is something that we're really focused on um, it'll probably take six months to a year for big changes to happen, as in, let's say, season seven of Exceed, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's say let's say season seven of Exceed is released in, you know, 16 territories. We're not at that stage, but we can say that, hey, we might be able to release Exceed Shovel Knight, you know, in three to seven territories. Yeah, outside of outside of the Americas, right? Cause, yes, cause outside, the the day, outside of North America, yes. Yeah, because even 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 just some other place outside America is like good enough, right? Like at least compared to now, where a lot of our distributions focus in America. Mm -hmm. um, so having localizations elsewhere. I mean, we've done it for other other games, right? There's a Japanese release for Imperial. I believe there's been Spanish releases of uh, Pixel Tactics, right? We have uh, released but... our games in nine different languages um, across our entire catalog. 
So we probably have more localization than the uh, average company. Yeah. Most most people are probably aware, and we need to make people aware of it. That's another that's another yeah. quote unquote problem, if you will, that just needs to yeah. be solved over time. But in terms, yeah. of it's it, also really difficult, right? Because a lot of the time, the things that get translated are indentured games, like games that games that people already know about. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, so it's kind of like weird because the marketing push comes significantly after the original marketing push for the game. Like for Pixel Tactics, for example, the the Spanish version of Pixel Tactics came out like years after the original one did. Right. So it's it's kind of weird. I'm not saying that the Spanish version's bad or anything, but it's it's kind of weird because most of the people who wanted the original Pixel Tactics already have it. Right. Yes. Like it, it's kind of like that. Right. So even if you were a Spanish uh, speaking person, if you could remotely understand English, you would probably already just bought the English version. Is what I'm well, saying. Well, if you are a partner and you're looking to publish any level 99 game in your territory or area, we do have a mailing list for you, so you can get in on the ground floor, so we can focus on worldwide releases and not just North America gets it first. Um, that is not yeah. our priority, actually. Exactly. We, we want to be able to uh, print the project with you um, simultaneously, so, right? Yes, exactly. It's- Exactly. So it's very good. If anybody out there, um, you know, knows a company that would be interested or anything like that, they just need to sign up for a mailing list regarding that, and we can open communication. Please feel free to go through our contact form on level ninety nine games dot com. Level ninety nine games dot com forward slash contact slash for, forward slash contact dash us. Right. I mean, you would know actually. <laughs> Really quick, um, the anime thing. Yes, I very much want an anime in, in in any of our properties. In Exceed, particularly. Yes, I believe the the French anime aesthetic would work. That is something that is in my mind. <laughs> Just wanted to touch base on that on the last oh, question. Okay, wait, wait. Let's talk about anime here. We all understand it would be completely lit. If Sailor Moon Exceed was a thin thing, right? Like I we all want agree on Sailor this. Sailor Moon Exceed so bad. Um, yeah. I just need to convince Brad it's a great idea. <laughs> we we I mean, how how could it not be a great idea? I mean, like here's the thing about Sailor Moon, it's awesome, right? Like it is great. Kind of dark sometimes, but we don't need to put all of the dark stuff into yeah. the game. Yeah, so, I mean, Br- Brad is unfamiliar with the property in the sense that he hasn't oh. watched all of the all of the episodes, or maybe only caught maybe one or two when he was younger. Um, I mean, so, I watched. I didn't watch it religiously, but yeah. I watched it about the same capacity that I watched Dragon Ball. Right? Like, yeah. Like I wouldn't watch every episode of Dragon Ball, but I would see enough of it to know it. Right? And there, there were initially way back when that was presented when I when I was hired, uh, there were concerns like, is there even a enough like characters for a season and it's like yes <laughs> how many planets mean? are there <laughs> there's well, this... a there's there's at least like nine because there's planets right yeah. and then villains like that's more than enough. oh you you can also add um useless tuxedo boy right like hey, it's hey, 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 hey rude okay rude i mean look, it's a joke right it's a joke in the community that tuxedo mask does nothing and that's fine right it's, it's funny he can communicate with the earth and stuff leave him alone <laughs> He's a, he's a king of the air. Who cares, man? He does I not. Do. He comes in. He look. This is what Tuxedo Mask does. Shh. Throw Rose on top of building. Usagi, you can do it. I mean, Sailor Moon, you can do it. Sailor Moon's like, heck yeah, I can do it. And then she does all the work. I mean, like he's he's literally just a bard. No, he, he just he goes sh- there and inspires Sailor Moon. He should, he should exceed moon. into like the Moonlight Night. That would be dope. <laughs> That would actually be dope. Exactly. Anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, whatever, whatever. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's 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 move on. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, for being on this episode of the podcast. It's always a treasure to thank have you, you for here. Thank you inviting uh, me. Yes, it's also really good to have somebody else who values, um, who's really good with audio, right? I'm Aww. not saying that the, my other co-hosts are bad with audio. It's just that you are the best one at it. So it's really nice to, you know, kind of bump you bump off ideas off of each other when it comes to audio so it's i'm really i'm really happy that you're here um i'm really also happy that you're really gung-ho to be available whenever (laughs) because that's not that's a quality that i really appreciate (laughs) well thank you luckily um i don't sleep ever so we generally are up at the same time (laughs) That's well, bad. no, it's it, it's if I have any meetings at like, you know, three or four in the morning, which can happen when you're talking with international, you know, businesses or, or partners, um, it doesn't really make sense for me to be awake at like 9am <laughs> uh, Pacific Standard Time or something. 
Yeah, so you kind of do weird graveyard shifts, which just so Sometimes, happen to be yeah. my shifts, right? Like, Correct. Because <laughs> I basically wake up at around 6 p.m. everybody else's time. And that's usually when you're awake. <laughs> so, uh, happy days, I guess. Sunday, Monday, happy days. Tuesday, oh. what? Nobody gets that reference. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's okay. I don't. I, look, here's the thing: if it's a reference to something about America, I just don't know, man. It's like it's an like, old. It's an old sitcom from like the, f- uh, the f- I don't know the. Is 60s. it called Happy Days? It's called Happy Days, but I think maybe it's the sixties or the fifties. Does anyone know how old that show is? <laughs> oh no, that this just reveals how old Jackie actually is. No, I just I Jackie's really... actually a sixty no. year old woman. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just really like old sitcoms, like I Love Lucy and stuff. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay, look, you can't. I can't judge you for that because some of my favorite music is uh, like sixties, seventies, uh, no, sixties and fifties serenade music. So Frank yeah. Sinatra, like, and stuff like that. So I mean, look, I can't judge you because I oh, like. Oh man, you gotta come to Vegas. Music. We have a Frank Sinatra museum. Ooh, old blue yeah. eyes himself. All right, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of the new Level Cap Podcast. Um, if you liked it, share it with a friend. If you hate it, share it with an enemy. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, typical YouTuber stuff. If you like this video, please share it with a friend. If you hate it, share it with an enemy. I said that already. As usual, that's been me, your host, Marco DeSantos, also known as Mechanic Christian. And with me has been my licensing Omega Death Squad Lord God of Licenses. Jackie Florian or Kanashini, whichever you want to call me. Don't matter. <laughs> And we thank you so much for listening to this episode. Without much else to say, don't forget your special action. And thank you, World of Indians. Thank you, and good night. Happy gaming, everyone. (laughs) The new Level Cap podcast is produced by Level 99 Games. Join us next Wednesday for more design talk and shenanigans. Thank you for listening.